All right, y'all, we're doing something a little bit different today. So recently, um, I got lucky enough to be chosen to be a featured storyteller at a fairly big event in my city, and I'm a little terrified to get up in front of 400 complete strangers and try and fit my life into 12 minutes or less. The theme is fast forward. And I was like, Mr. G, where can you do a dry run? I was like, wait, I can do it for you guys first. We can put it on the YouTubes. So with no further ado, you're going to get Mr. G's life story highlights in 12 minutes or less. So here we go. <clears throat> you know how they say people can't really change? I would agree with that up to a point. Now, this is a story that begins with me telling a gigantic lie about 18 years ago. So like all really good stories, this story begins with a girl. So fortunately for Mr. G, this was the early 2000s, so I didn't have to do internet dating. Um, I didn't have to do Tinder, any of that stuff. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be majoring in elementary education. So there were about 102 girls in every class to like every two dudes. And one day I'm at a bar. I know this is a long time ago. And I see a lovely lady from one of my education classes. And I walk up to this lady in the bar, give her my phone number. And one thing leads to another. And we've moved in together. We're going to classes together. Things look amazing. The future is bright. And that lovely lady asks me a very simple question. She says, do you enjoy travel? Now, this is when my brain just goes into slow down mode. Because if you don't know this about me, I grew up on a very, very tiny farm next to a very tiny town in the middle of nowhere. And even simple activities like going to the big city to go school clothes shopping gave me anxiety. So do I enjoy traveling? Did I enjoy traveling? Absolutely not. I was planning on getting a job and dying in the small town near where I grew up and never seeing any of the world because, frankly, I was terrified of it. But back to this beautiful woman who's sitting on a couch across from me and staring into my eyes and asking me this question, which I was like, it can't be that big of a deal, right? Maybe we'll go to the lake from time to time. And so I say, yeah. I like travel. And in everyone's life, you have that moment, you know, where a simple thing kind of, you, you know, they say your whole life turns on a dime. That was that was that moment for me. So one thing led to another. Uh, we ended up doing our student teaching in New Zealand. So right away, we were two young kids off on the other side of the planet. This was before smartphones. I'll tell you what, traveling without a smartphone was a different beast in and of itself. That went great. We did that. We got our degrees. We became educators. Things were fine. And we ended up deciding to get a job overseas. We ended up in Kazakhstan. And this was around the time that the movie Borat was very popular. No, we didn't choose Kazakhstan because of Borat, but it just happened to be an opportunity that came up. We're like, we'll do this for one year. And uh, we ended up doing two years. I learned how to speak a little bit of Russian and to professionally hitchhike. That's a thing in Kazakhstan. You just flag people down and you're like, hey, can I get a ride? I'll pay you this much gas money. Uh, and my life is already changing faster than I'm ready to cope with. Kazakhstan led to a new job in Thailand where we would actually live for seven years. A beautiful place. Both of my children were born in Thailand. Um, my second child was born in Bangkok because our hospital experience in the city we lived in in Thailand was pretty bad, and I had to learn to be brave enough to drive into downtown Bangkok. If you didn't know, on Thailand, they drive on the left side of the road, so you already have that bit of stress and confusion, but... Uh, it was the most terrifying experience for me at the time, just trying to figure out how to get to the hospital in downtown Bangkok um, back in the day. But don't regret it. Seven years there, I'm planning to take my kids back there soon to show them where they were born and where they grew up. But Thailand led to more opportunities. We ended up in Sarajevo, in Bosnia. Amazing place, interesting place, people that have been through a lot. Um, 
And one experience we had there was, of course, my wife loves to run. She was running a race in a blizzard. She got lost in what might have been an old Serbian minefield, had to call Mountain Rescue. They found her. She still finished the race because that's just her. And then the pandemic happened, right? You guys remember that? Yeah, it kicked off in Italy kind of sort of after the whole China part. And that's when the president then was like, no more planes out of Europe. So my wife and I got on the, I'm not making this up, the literal last plane uh, out of Europe. And our boss let us finish our jobs remotely. Grateful for that. Then we had a little bit of time back in the U.S. I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, being a teacher during the first year or two of the pandemic was uh, not the most fun come back to your country uh, experience after a long time abroad. And so... My wife basically looked at me and said, you can't do public school anymore here in the U.S. because it is stressing you out so badly. So it was about a year into the pandemic. You know, people were doing the vaccines. We're like, hey, it's fine. The world's normal again. Let's go abroad again. And an old boss of ours said, hey, you should come to this country uh, in West Africa. Now, I'm not going to say the country and I'm not going to say the city because I don't want to throw a country under the bus. But as I'm alluding here, this story is not going to go well. So red flags were were popping up. But this was a a person we'd worked with for a long time. She was going to be our boss over there. She's like, no, I visited it. You're going to love it. It's going to be great. So we interview. We get the job. You know, we're like, hey, you know, it's Africa. Should we should we take, um, you know, anti-malarial medicine before we go? And they're like, no, you don't want to worry. Don't do that. It doesn't it's not going to leave you feeling very good. Just just skip that. So we're like, okay, off we go. We're setting up in our new job here in West Africa. We've got our kids with us. Um, we're having a meeting, a staff meeting, and then they bring in the, the the nurse. She is not a foreign hire like my wife and I are. She's a local from the country. And the first thing she tells us is that a member of staff, the vice principal's wife, actually died the year before, which is why we had a new principal. They're like, yeah, she got malaria and they went back to England. They didn't know what it was. And, and she straight up just died. And my wife, everyone was like, hands up, like, wait, what? Um, and long story short, things didn't go well. My oldest child, my son, got what we think was, was dengue fever, which is also known as bone break fever because it hurts so bad. Your bones hurt. Um, We tried to get him to a proper hospital, but this was during the pandemic in West Africa. So the hospital scenes were terrifying. Um, You'd go to these clinics and these hospitals, and we're talking hundreds of people just lining the halls trying to get seen. Um, Fortunately for my son, we were were able to pull him through. We were able to get some, some tiny little clinics to get him on IV drips. We were calling nurses and doctor friends back in the States. Um, keeping his temperature below 105 as much as possible by overdosing him on ibuprofen and acetaminophen, and he made it. Um, One of the worst times of my life until things continued to get worse, and that's when I realized that during the entire time that my son had been sick, I didn't realize that my wife was actually getting even sicker. Um, She'd been doing everything in her power to help look after our son, and you know how people can suck it up when times are tough. Now, I'm not a brave person, and this story really is about me just trying to be a third, a fraction, a tenth as brave as my wife, because I said I lied that I like travel and I wasn't afraid of stuff, but I was. Always been afraid of stuff. But my wife ended up having malaria. She must have got it within the first couple days we were in country. If you don't know about malaria, it's a mosquito-borne disease. If you're not taking the anti-malarials, which we've been instructed not to do by our boss, um, you're prone to get it. So at this point, my wife has probably had malaria building up in her system for like two weeks, and she is not doing well at all really, really badly. She'd been powering through it for a long, long time, but she's to the point where her whole body hurts and she could barely move. Um, And it was bad. And I'd realized with my son that going to the doctor's uh, offices was going to be bad. Going to the hospitals was going to be extremely bad. So I actually ended up to basically bribe a doctor to come to my house to take care of my wife. That's where things were. I managed to find a guy that knew a guy where they basically gave cash money to doctors 
outside their shifts to come to your house. So I'm desperately waiting for this guy to come to my house. Now, this particular country speaks French. So the doctor gets there. This doctor is maybe 21, 22 years old, young local person. And I was told that he was going to be bringing powerful malaria medicine for my wife because we'd been giving her the -the over-the-counter medicine and it had been doing absolutely nothing. So he gets there and in French, he's asking me, and we're using my phone, of course, because my French is not good. Uh, No S bone. Um, He's basically using Google Translate and he's like, do you have needles? I'm like, bro, you are the doctor. No, I don't have needles. Okay, I thought you were going to have that, right? I did manage to to get the medicine that he'd asked me to pick up and I'd gotten a prescription for. But I'm like, dude, I didn't buy needles. So it's about 9.35 at night. He's like, well, you need needles. And he's turning to leave. And I'm like, no, you're going to get in the car with me and we're going to go find a pharmacy that's open and we're going to go get some needles. So we find the one pharmacy in town that's open and it is in the not good place part of town and this is a pretty massive city and we're talking about this is a city where the rich people live in homes with 12 foot walls and electrified razor wire around their house and drive toyota fjs with steel armor over the windows it's not a town that you want to drive into this part at nighttime but there is this doctor who's about to leave we need medicine there's one pharmacy open for about another 20 minutes so we get in my little tiny car beat up honda crv and he's sitting next to me in the driver's seat and off we go and the things you would see in the city uh, at nighttime driving through the town other than abject poverty and flaming piles of garbage and all kinds of things on the street it's just needless to say not a place i wanted to be but it's surprising how scared you're able to be when you love somebody else right i'm not saying that i'm not brave but i was getting better at being really scared so we make it to this pharmacy and one of the things you do in this country is if you're in a really bad part of town you pay somebody to guard your vehicle while you go into a building so that someone else doesn't steal it and take it which is immediately what i do we get in there we get the needles we get back in the car and we get back and my wife gets her first injection of pretty powerful anti-malarial medicine Um, and over the course of the next couple of weeks you know we got her healthy enough that she could go to work and, and, and do her job and then my wife and I were left with the other question of we just put our kids through all this trauma we just did all this and why are we still here and so we ended up actually that's the first time we quit a contract um, and left in the middle of the year we we done a lot of stuff and been a lot of places but um my wife was like we can't ask our kids to 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 go through this and we were trying to get them the malaria medicine over there just to keep them from getting it and it was too expensive it was bad things were bad so that's a whole other story we managed to sneak away in the night and try and fly back to the u.s there was a storm in istanbul we made it um we actually teach privately online now Life is good. Things are going great. We work from home. It is about the tamest, quietest existence compared to uh, what we used to do. But uh, we did just recently come back from a vacation in Chile, which is nice. So where I'm coming from with this is, can people change? Some. I'm still a total pain to travel with, even when we're going to really, you know, big super safe places like iceland or chile i will still find everything to worry about and i will worry about it but i will go and have fun even though i will annoy my wife the entire time by being overly anxious about everything but i did learn how to be better at being terrified and better at being scared because if you can just accept it and keep going and do what you have to do it makes life a whole heck of a lot easier and i'm very very much grateful that that woman 18 years later is still putting up with me and has helped turn me into a person that can actually go out and do stuff in the real world. And without her, I wouldn't have that. So big thank you to Mrs. G for that. Thank you, YouTube, for letting me practice this story. If you have questions about it, you can put them in the comments. Or if you have feedback on how I can make it better, throw it down in there. And I will see you guys on the next one. Mr. G out.